Hey guys, welcome back to a new episode of Bolt Breakdowns here on the Guilty as Charged podcast YouTube channel. So what I wanted to talk about today is uh, what we did from our last podcast, which Tyler did create kind of a separate clip if you want to check it out from our YouTube channel. It is a you know smaller clip than the whole you know hour-long podcast show we do, but we did this video called How Justin Herbert Changed Our Valuation Process, and it's about a four or five minute video uh, from you know that podcast where we discussed the draft, Justin Herbert, what we got right, what we got wrong, um, and here's the thing: uh, I didn't really contribute that actively to the conversation. Uh, or at least not as actively as I felt I could have contributed. Uh, so I did kind of want to take this moment to talk about what I thought about Justin Herbert at the time, how I think, you know, say Justin Herbert and Josh Allen and, and players like that affect draft evaluations going forward based on their success, as well as maybe give you a little bit of insight into maybe how I viewed draft grades before and how I view draft grades now. Um, so the first thing I think is important to talk about is what did I think about Herbert at the time? So when Justin Herbert was drafted on April 23rd, 2020, uh, I did write the grades article for Bolt Beat, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that now. Now, uh, if you scroll to the bottom, uh, this idiot decided to give Justin Herbert, uh, a B minus when he was originally drafted. Uh, so that, I don't know why this guy's talking. But this guy decided to give Justin Herbert a B minus, and uh, yeah, it, it, you know that might come off as bad, uh, given that Justin Herbert did win Rookie of the Year and, and came along a lot faster than he thought he would. But you know, more so than the grade, I wanted to look back on what my criticisms were, what I was really thinking about the whole situation, and to be honest, I think I kind of nailed the Justin Herbert thing. But let's talk about that. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things that I did say is that the Chargers were going to either take Herbert or pass on a quarterback the first round entirely. I don't think they would have taken Jordan Love. And, you know, it did come out uh, after the draft about a week later when Tom Telesco went on the Pat McAfee show that he was going to take either Tua Tagovailoa or Justin Herbert. Um, that was something that did come out. They wanted to take a quarterback and establish their future, even though they viewed Tyrod as a respectable starter, right? Uh, one of the things I liked about Herbert, uh, he does have a powerful arm, pocket presence is sound, can evade pressure, good mobility, right? I think those were the things that you could say about Herbert. Also, 6'5", has that prototypical quarterback build, right? That was something that you could say really at the time of the draft, regardless of whether you had a positive or negative look uh, you know, at Herbert, right? It was like a quarterback who was built in a lab. Now, whether you bought some of the between-the-ears stuff was really the question, right? Um, so I said that it wouldn't surprise me if the Chargers sat Herbert, uh, for the whole year. Uh, they did not sat Herbert. They did not sit Herbert for the whole year because, uh, Tyrod unfortunately got stabbed in the lung. Justin Herbert comes into the Chiefs game and the rest is history, right? So that part didn't age well, but I, I couldn't have really predicted the whole needle thing. Now let's talk about some of the negatives. Uh, if you watch Herbert's tape, I thought that he had a bit of a tendency at Oregon to stare down receivers and not fully go through progressions. Um, this was something that was sort of evident, but you know what I do mention in one of these next paragraphs here, uh, if you're looking at reasons for optimism, it comes with the weapons that Herbert will have, right? Mike Williams and Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry uh, last season, Austin Eckler, right? These were all better weapons than Justin Herbert had at Oregon. And this is something that Mina Kimes talked about in her misevaluation of Justin Herbert, so to speak, in the recent uh, Herbert Kimes piece. Uh, so I did th think his deep ball was a little bit worse uh, on tape than he demonstrated last year. Obviously, he got a lot better throwing the deep ball with Jalen Guyton and Tyron Johnson and those jump balls to Mike Williams, right? Uh, those definitely helped him out quite a bit. Uh, and kind of going more deeply into it, I did sort of talk about the Oregon coaching, you know, on offense, right? He had all these offensive coordinators all these years. Granted, he's getting another one this year, so we'll have to see how that turns out in Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, you can judge for yourself. But what I really said in a lot of this article, other than at the end when I said I'd rather have Isaiah Simmons, who I was a huge fan of, uh, is I give Herbert a B-minus. Right. And you might read all that and say, 
uh, it comes off as pretty accurate, right? Herbert had these problems going through progressions, but there was also a lot of upside and things that I think he could improve on in the league, right? So to me, a B minus grade wasn't so much a poo poo on Herbert as it was uh, a evaluation, right? If this guy gets better at these things, then I think this will be a great pick. If this guy doesn't improve, then I think he'll either stick at a kind of B tier quarterback level or you know, like Mitch Trubisky sort of start maybe good, but then regress, right? So that was my feelings on Justin Herbert coming out of college. Um, and I think when we talk about, you know, did we did we get Justin Herbert wrong? I don't really feel like I did. I did not think that Justin Herbert would have the rookie year that he did. Quite, ob- quite obviously, I expected Tyrod Taylor to start and then Justin Herbert to take the reins at some point. Um, but when you talk about what Justin Herbert got better at, I think he got better at quite a few things that I considered negatives coming out of college and watching his tape. Uh, something that Tyler did mention in the YouTube comments of the previous video is that we did not have access to all 22 throughout the draft process. So maybe that would have changed my perspective on Justin Herbert, but I do think all 22 is more important for the you know high quality kind of defensive positions as well as you know the skill players on offense right i don't think that matters quite as much for the quarterback but maybe it would have changed our minds um but while justin herbert has worked out i don't think that justin herbert and josh allen present you with you know a blueprint to say oh well these two guys who were six five with big arms inaccurate technicalities and inaccurate mechanics right you know just because they worked out doesn't mean that you should just go grab every quarterback who looks like they were built in a lab, right? Because for every Justin Herbert, for every Josh Allen, there is a Blake Bortles who was 6'5 and had a big arm. There is a Drew Locke who is, I think, 6'3", 6'4", and has a, you know, decently strong arm. And that's one of the better parts of his game. But every other throw is kind of, you know, inaccurate or inconsistent, right? So, just because Justin Herbert did work doesn't mean that I think he's the new rule going forward. And that's actually what I would like to say in response to that video, because Steven did say um, you want to look at the quarterbacks and the draft prospects and look at what they can do over what they can do. But I think it's important to point out what they can't do, right? It's important to look at Justin Herbert and say, oh, well, he didn't do this, this, and this in college, but I think he can get better at it at the pros, Right. We recently talked about this with Chris Rumpf and some of the other current 2021 uh, rookie class prospects, right, that the Chargers did draft. Um, I think it's still important because if a quarterback does get better at those things, then, you know, they're on this ascending, you know, route that Justin Herbert is. If they don't, then they're kind of going to be stuck in this weird intermediary like someone uh, like Mitch Trubisky was, right? I think that that's a fair point. Um, So... This is uh, also kind of what we did in terms of the draft grades this year. I actually, I think we only shared the uh, spreadsheet on Patreon, but this was sort of my philosophy and and how I viewed it. Um, You can see what Steven and Tyler did versus what I did. So Steven and Tyler had these grades out of eight. So they graded all the prospects and then, you know, according to the numbers, uh, ranked them all. Yeah, Steven's top prospect was Panay Sewell. Mine was Trevor Lawrence. Tyler's was Trevor Lawrence uh, by a slim margin. So, you know, you can go through the whole list and and look at where we had a lot of these guys. Um, But one thing that I did was I did not associate any numbers and and try to, like, overly grade these prospects. My top 50 big board was more of just the guys that I've watched um, and how I would kind of rank them in terms of how much I want them um, at the next level. Um, and so for me, that was a little bit different than what I did in 2020 because I, I did not do a draft big board. I didn't do any of these things. Um, I watched a lot more film this year than I would say I did in 2020 for sure. Um, just because we, this was the first time that I did the draft with the podcast back in 2020. Uh, I didn't do anything <laughs> with the podcast because I wasn't on it yet. I, I went to the draft party that uh, Gak had at the time. When it was Jason and Tyler and Stephen, um, but uh, I did not do anything in terms of you know uh, real intense scouting like maybe I did this year, um, and so that's I think an important thing going forward, right? Uh, and it, it's also worth pointing out, right? We're grading people as prospects, right? That's the big thing is like people can go up, people can go down. You can give someone a really high grade 
coming out of college. And then a few years later, maybe they're not uh, coming up on that potential or maybe a guy that you slammed in the draft process, so to speak, really improves. And then, you know, it's kind of vice versa, right? So you can still have those situations where you give the guy this draft grade and then he turns out to be different uh, than your expectation or draft rating, if you will. Um, so I think that's the important thing to talk about, right? So has Justin Herbert really changed the way that I look at draft prospects? I think that Justin Herbert has made me more open to the idea of a less than perfect quarterback, right? Josh Allen, I think, has done this too a little bit for some people. Lamar Jackson is another one where it's like, well, this guy was good in college, but he still has these, you know, uh, mechanics and tendencies that really worry you about how he'll do at the next level, right? I would throw Jordan Love a little bit into that category as well. Obviously, Jordan Love was not, <laughs> hasn't started an NFL game yet. But the thing you'll see about Jordan Love, right, when you go back and watch his tape from college prior to the 2020 draft is he had these brilliant moments where, you know, he looked like Patrick Mahomes. But then, you know, there was a lot of uh, what people called Jekyll and Herbert, right, in reference to Jekyll and Hyde, where he also had these really, really bad moments in games. Um, so I, I think that that's uh, something that shows up on tape when you look at somebody like Jordan Love, right? But it's about whether uh, a team has the infrastructure, whether a team has the right coaching, whether a team has the right weapons around them. Right. That was something that I mentioned in my bolt beat piece. Right. You have uh, Mike Williams and Keenan Allen and Hunter Henry and all these weapons that uh, are vast improvements <laughs> over what Justin Herbert had at Oregon, at least relative to, say, what Tua had at Alabama, what uh, Joe Burrow had at LSU. Right. Coming into the draft. So I think Herbert has changed the perception um, that, you know, if you have a guy that's in this environment, he can be different than what he was in that environment, right? If you surround him with the right coaching and the right pieces. Uh, and mechanics are more moldable now, right? There's so many quarterback gurus like Jordan Palmer, who's worked with a lot of these quarterbacks. Um, and you obviously have Pep Hamilton, who coached Justin Herbert, right? In his first year with the Chargers um, and apparently did a tremendous job. Wish him the best of luck with the Texans. Um, so, you know, a lot of these traits are more moldable. I think, uh, if you compare it to the draft 10 years ago, I think there was a motivation to look for the perfect quarterback prospect, but now I think GMs are getting a little bit more creative and say, well, what prospect can give me the more perfect quarterback eventually, even if they're a little rough around the edges now. Right. And, and that's what you saw with Josh Allen and Justin Herbert. Right. I think those those are two pretty good examples. So I think that Justin Herbert has made me more flexible in terms of what I'm willing to look for in quarterback play, but I don't think he's changed the grand scheme of things. Cause as I mentioned in my bolt beat article, uh, I did mention a lot of the things that Justin Herbert did improve at, right? So, or, you know, did improve at in his rookie year that he wasn't great at in college. So I think that that's the most important thing is, you know, you still want to look at a quarterback and say, um, you know, these are the things that he needs to fix. These are the things he's very good at. And, you know, here's my grade or here's what I think about the draft pick. Right. Um, again, the, the Isaiah Simmons over Herbert thing, you know, I was very high on Isaiah Simmons at the time. And I think he showed some flashes towards the end of last year of his potential in the NFL. I think he's still going to be a very good player, but obviously you wouldn't take him over, you know, the high end quarterback. Right. So I think it's fair that I, I did not think Justin Herbert was going to be this good. But in terms of diagnosing his problems, I actually felt that I was pretty accurate and Justin Herbert improved at a lot of those things in his rookie year. Um, and the things that I said he was good at in college, right? And the physical tools, um, you know, some of the third down awareness, some of the things he did in games, he was still very good at at the pros, right? So that's really how I think about Justin Herbert is not so much that he's changed uh, the macro of how I draft prospects and how I think about them going forward. But it's more about, um, I think it's more dependent on team infrastructure. I think it's more uh, dependent on how you really view the system uh, in addition to, okay, what did he have in college and what will he have in the NFL, right? What, what did he have to deal with in college? What, did he have to, what will he have to deal with in the NFL, right? That comes more when you're looking at a Josh Allen, I think, who goes to like a Wyoming, a Carson Wentz, who goes to North Dakota State, 
what they'll have to play uh, at, say, the FCS level versus what they'll have to play at the NFL level, right? So I think that's an important thing to reference. Obviously, Wyoming is not the FCS, but it is not the SEC or Power 5 conference, right? That Or, or Power 5 team, I should say. Um, so in the macro, I think that Justin Herbert has changed a lot of minds uh, about being open to new quarterbacks and new draft prospects instead of maybe writing them off entirely. But I do still think it is important to look at what a quarterback does positively and negatively and track that out through their NFL careers, right? Because again, for every Justin Herbert, for every Josh Allen, there is a Mitch Trubisky, there is a Blake Bortles, there is a Drew Locke. So just because you see this quarterback who looks like he was built in a lab doesn't mean that he'll live up to that potential. It's all about what you have around him and whether he really uh, is going to push the boundaries on, you know, what uh, his what he needs to improve at, right? I think that that's the most important thing. So a B minus grade might seem rough, and I did give Herbert that draft grade. But if you actually go back to that article, I feel like I was right on quite a few things in terms of diagnosing the things that Justin Herbert got better at in his 2020 Rookie of the Year campaign. Uh, of course, couldn't predict the tie rod needle, so that didn't happen. Uh, all right, subscribe to the channel below. Let me know what you think about my draft evaluation of Justin Herbert. How did you feel at the time versus how you feel now? Let me know in the comments down below, and I will see you guys next time.